Well, welcome everybody. As Mike said, my name is also Mike. I'm a pharmacist. I've been here for a long time. He and BMT, mostly inpatient, but a little bit of clinic. Um, this is the first I heard that you guys had to take a quiz. I didn't submit questions, so I have no idea what's on the Sam Lumer's quiz. So anyway, today we're going to be talking about uh, the meds listed here. We won't go through all of them. There um, is a lot of slides. We're not going to get through all of them. There's 150 plus. The ones in blue are just references. And the way we're really going to do it is we'll pick like a, a, a one drug in each class and kind of focus on that one. All right. So just to get people thinking, we'll answer this at the end. I know people who were here last year know the answer, but think about why is chemotherapy unique among medications? This is really targeted therapy or not non-targeted, but cytotoxic therapy. We're talking about why is it dosed in body surface area? You know, there's a lot of drugs that have a narrow therapeutic indexes. So just something to think about as we're going through the slides. All right, just starting at the very beginning here, we have the growth cycle. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail here, just to point out that the, on the right, the cell cycles, non-specific agents work in all phases of the cell cycle. And that's really because they work on preformed DNA, and that's the anthracycline antibiotics that we're going to talk about. And then we have the other classes, paclitaxel, um, the vinca alkaloids, and etoposide, all work more or less in one or two specific cell cycles. This is just a quick... Um, background or reminder for everybody from school. So we have Gompertz in growth. So this is slow growth. Then it goes to exponential growth. These are the tumor cells. And then it goes to slow growth again. So it's a sigmoidal shaped curve. And obviously chemotherapy works in dividing cells. So it works mostly in the exponential growth phase. The goldie coldman hypothesis says resistance is independent of the chemotherapeutic agent, independent on the number of cell divisions. So what that really means is the larger the tumor size and the longer you have a delay in initiating chemotherapy, the more likely that you're going to have resistant cells. And tumor log kill fractional kill hypothesis basically says that when you administer cytotoxic chemotherapy, a certain percentage of cells is killed by each chemotherapy administration that remains constant. So you may kill 90% of the cells, and then the next time you get your next cycle, you're killing 90% of the remaining cells. So you have to give multiple courses of chemotherapy to eradicate the tumors. And then just the last one, the Norton-Simon hypothesis, says the rate of cancer cell death due to treatment is directly proportional to tumor rate or tumor growth rate at the time of treatment, um, which makes sense. The, the dividing cells are the ones that are sensitive to the chemotherapy for the most part. These are the drugs that we're going to talk about. And if you look at them, they are older than pretty much everybody here. Um, the 60s, 70s, 90s, and then the newest drugs are actually in the 2000s. But they are commonly used drugs in cancer treatment, especially the anthracyclines and taxanes. Um, the anthracyclines is probably the, the most common one. They work in solid tumors. We also use those in malignancies. So the, the AMLs, the lymphomas, um, the taxanes are also widely used too. So jumping in, the anthracyclines, these are natural products isolated from microbial sources. They're deeply colored. Some agents were synthesized as stable dyes. One of the nicknames originally of doxorubicin was red death. So these are for the most part red colored drugs. Um, they're one of the most commonly used anti-cancer agents, and they have a, a broad spectrum of activity, which I said is similar to alkylating agents and the taxanes. And these are the agents that we have. I'm not going to go through all these, just to point out that we have several liposomal forms of um, also of doxorubicin and donorubicin, and we also have a combination product, which we'll talk a little bit about um, Fixios because it's kind of interesting. And finally, mitosanthrone is put in with this class of drugs, even though um, technically it's not an anthracycline. These are just the structures. We don't have a lot of structures, but I did put this just to sh illustrate that these are very similar in their structure. And like doxo and donorubicin differ only by a, a hydroxyl group. Um, so even though they're structurally very similar, they have uh, somewhat different distinct patterns of clinical activity. So donorubicin and idorubicin are used primarily in the acute leukemias, whereas doxorubicin and epirubicin have a little bit broader activity, and these are broader activity against some um, solid tumors. And if we look at the bottom right, we have mitosanthrone, which you can tell it's structurally different, but it still has those three um, hexagonal um, rings, which gives it somewhat similar activity. So there's multiple mechanisms of action 
um, the induced formation of covalent topoisomerase 2 DNA complexes, and this inhibition prevents religation of DNA, causing DNA strand breaks. The second one is intercalation between base pairs, um, which inhibits nucleotide replication and um, DNA RNA polymerase. And we have enzymatic reduction, which produces a variety of highly reactive free radicals. So this adds to the cytotoxicity, but also the toxicity of these agents. And in mitosantrone has a decreased ability to form these um, free radicals, which probably is one of the reasons it has less cardiac toxicity. This is just a quick schematic for people who are visual learners. Uh, Topoisomerase 2 actually makes um, two cuts, and these base pairs aren't um, right across from each other. They're like four base pairs, base pairs apart. And what topoisomerase 2 is, it, it basically cuts and it binds to this covalently. So it forms this stable complex that uh, your polymerases cannot get around. And these are among the most efficient inducers of apoptosis with maximum killing in the, the S and G2 phases. This is this, and the previous slide was actually the main mechanism of action. This is an interesting mechanism of action. If we look at it, if we remember those um, hexagonal type rings that we had just shown, you get this intercalation, which is the bottom right into this, the sugar backbone of the DNA. And it puts this torsional strain on this backbone, as you can see in the schematic that it's not, it's not shaped like it normally is. And this is where this interferes with um, binding for polymerases and transcriptions and DNA um, repair systems. So resistance occurs due to um, transport by the puke like a protein, um, the MDR multiple drug resistant gene product and MRP is multiple resistant protein. Um, phenotypically, um, functionally, these are very similar. Genetically, they're different. We can also have down regulation by mutations of topoisomerase 2 and um, increased neutralization neutralization factors and overexpression of anti-apoptotic molecules such as PCR2. Just a note, mitosantrone is not transported by p glycoprotein and resistance occurs to topoisomerase 2 um, inhibition. This is just a, I think it's a Google screenshot, kind of interesting because we're pharmacists, so the lipid bilayer is actually made of pills. So it's not in reality, we know that. But basically, you can get exposed to one drug such as a toposide, you get these pumps that are produced in the cell wall, and then you can get exposure to other drugs, such as structurally not related drugs, such as anthracyclines or taxanes, and they can be pumped out by this pump that was induced by a different chemotherapeutic agent, hence the name multiple drug resistance. These are the indications. I'm not going to go through all of these, just to say that there's lots of FDA indications, um, considering this is a, a very old drug, and there's also non-FDA um, uses here. So quickly jump to a case. So we have HP is a 35 year old male with um, stage four Hodgkin, Hodgkin's receiving ABVD. Um, drugs are listed here. He comes to the on clinic to receive his fifth cycle of ABVD and complaints of tachycardia, shortness of breath, non-productive cough, and pulmonary exam reveals neck vein distension, pulmonary rails, and some ankle edema. He's currently only, this would be unique, only on amlodipine five milligrams. So anthracyclines, when you think about it, we should think about cardiac toxicity. And it's divided into three stages, or yeah, three different stages. So we have acute or subacute, and this occurs. Actually, it can occur while the medication is infusing, or very soon after. This is rare. Um, we have chronic cardiac toxicity. This results in cardiomyopathy. This is the the, the most concerning um, that we have as clinicians, and probably the most common form of damage. Characteristically, it occurs within a year of. Um, treatment. And we have late onset cardiac toxicity. This results in intraventricular dysfunction and arrhythmias, which can occur um, years to decades after treatment. Just a little bit about each one. Uh, the acute toxicity occurs, like I said, it can actually occur during infusion and it's electrophysiological abnormalities. Um, sinus tachycardia is probably the most common. People are not put on um, telemetry to be monitored. There are cases, especially early on, I'm not sure why we don't see them anymore, but there were rare cases of cardiac toxicity resulting in acute failure of the left ventricle, pericarditis, um, like I said, which there have been a couple fatal cases reported. The mechanism of action of the, um, the congestive heart failure, really it's based on the, the chemo and the cardiomyocytes. And you can, you can think of it, this is, maybe an oversimplification, but there's type two, which you get death through necrosis or apoptosis. 
clearly not reversible, or you have type two cardiomyocyte dysfunction, whereas you can get certain amounts of chemotherapy, it can cause this dysfunction, but it may be re reversible and it doesn't result in uh, the death of the cardiomyocytes. And just a quick mechanism is the main mechanism is inhibition of topoisomerase two beta, they have an alpha and a beta. This is active in quiescent non-proliferating cells, including cardiomyocytes. And basically, um, this they bind to this, and it results in the um, mitochondrial damage and um, the death of these cells. So the chronic cardiac toxicity, um, like I said, it occurs within a year. The exact mechanism is, they say it's unknown, but it's really, we think, um, due to um, topo 2 damage to the my myocardium, and it's related to peak concentrations, which means shorter infusions generally when you take a drug in a syringe and give it, you can get higher concentrations than a continuous infusion. And just as a general rule of thumb is that you can tolerate twice as much anthracycline exposure on a continuous infusion, say 24 hours versus a 15 minute push. I think this is an interesting chart. It's um, somewhat old, but it's doxorubicin and it's patients who were, uh, uh, I can't remember what the patient population was, but there's like 4,000 patients. So there's a lot of um, patients, 88 cases of congestive heart failure. And if you look at the bottom axis, the total dose milligrams per meter squared, somewhere around the four to 500 um, range is where you really start seeing this, this toxicity. Um, that being said, People can tolerate, you know, it's it's not totally predictable. Some people are going to show these symptoms at 300. Other people can tolerate, you know, six and 700 milligrams per meter squared and um, even higher doses if you use the liposomal product. There is a conversion factor, which means they're not all the same in their toxicity. There's multiple different ones out here. This is just an example. And just to quickly explain it, the doxorubicin, if you have one, um, 450 milligrams per meter squared to get 5% incidence. Donorubicin, it is half as cardiotoxic, so you can tolerate twice as much. And idorubicin would be twice as toxic, given it a two, so you can really tolerate um, half as much as you can with doxorubicin. Um, when we um, order chemotherapy and verify chemotherapy, this is one of the things that we check, and we convert these to doxorubicin equivalents, so we kind of have an idea of um, how much exposure they've had. This is just a quick screenshot from Epic, if you're ever looking at it, or HealthLink, that you can just go under lifetime dose tracking, and anything that was administered here in our system or on our platform will show it here, so we can see that you have the percentage, 110% of what we had set as the maximum dose. So it's a relatively straightforward way to go and um, look at the, the total anthracycline exposure that patients have received. So. Uh, risk factors, I think I mentioned these higher rates of administration, previous cardiac irradiation, older people, um, younger people, um, female gender, pre existing heart disease, and treatment with other chemotherapeutic agents or meds that can cause toxicity. And we have cyclophosphamide, trastuzumab, paclitaxel. And like I said, there's a wide variety of individual sensitivity to these meds. So prevention and monitoring. They have guidelines. I don't really, I'm not really going to go through all these, but basically you should get a baseline ejection fraction. And when you get to somewhere around 250 milligrams per meter squared, um, it's probably worth checking again, um, considering if you're going to keep treating the patients. And there's not a lot of, there are some agents that we can use. We'll talk about uh, dextrazoxane in a little bit. There's other agents you can use, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs that uh, can help mitigate some of this toxicity. So this is the patient here. And well, basically, let me see what I was gonna say. Basically he had come in and is demonstrating some symptoms of congestive heart failure. It's probably not a realistic case exactly because he only has 200 milligrams per meter squared. He does have some risk factors. He had concurrent radiation. He does have hypertension. And what are the treatment options for the patient? Well, these are the guidelines. We're not going to go through all of this, but basically, um, if you get a big enough decrease in your ejection fraction, that you're probably going to change to different therapy. And prevention is key. Limit lifetime doses to around 450 milligrams with bolus administration. Like I said, you can probably get twice as much as you do uh, continuous infusions. And we'll talk about dextrazoxin. 
um, a little bit. You can use liposomal formulations. I don't do a lot of um, practice in Gain, but the few days I was at clinic is I noticed that people are getting significantly higher exposure to anthracyclines, like 1,000 milligrams per meter squared um, with the liposomal product. Things that do not work, the N-acetylcysteine, coenzyme Q, different vitamins don't work. And here we'll talk about um, dexrazacin. Um, it's, it was originally believed to exert its cardioprotective effect by chelating iron. And that turns out it's probably not the case now because other iron chelators do not work to decrease the toxicity. So really it's thought to be inhibition of the topiracimerase 2 beta. It's approved for metastatic breast cancer patients who are responding to doxorubicin. Guidelines say other malignancies similar to above, since the toxicity is similar, this treatment or prevention probably will work, and we have used it on other patients, for example, Ida Rubicin, um, even though there's not a lot of data to support that, logically it should work. And the doses we have here, and the reason is, you don't see this, it's not super common. Um, there is myelosuppressions potentiated by the drug, and then there's concerns about interference with the anti-tumor efficacy of anthracyclines, lower response rates, faster tumor progression was seen in one study, um, I believe with early breast cancer. Most of the information doesn't support this. And then it's unknown whether it's effective for late um, onset cardiac effects. I have noticed that it seems to be um, more common in children used um, prophylactically than in adults. It's not, not very common in adults. And other um, adverse effects, bone marrow suppressions, primarily neutropenia. These are vesicants, um, nausea and vomiting, so it's highly emetic. So you really use a three or four drug regimen, pre-med the patient, mucositis and diarrhea, and alopecia is um, pretty much universal. So uh, extravasation, since that does happen, we have good guidelines. You stop the injection, you aspirate, you apply ice. Um, you can consider treatment with hydrocortisone and hydrocortisone cream. Probably should get a plastics consult if they extravasate, especially peripherally. Uh, I think this is just interesting because there was a lawsuit here. We've got two different drugs, two different brands. The one on the left is the one you use to prevent cardiac toxicity. It's the exact same drug that you use if you treat extravasation. And the manufacturer of the extravasation one was threatening to sue the other one because it was cheaper and people were substituting their product. But if you actually look at the structures, they're the identical drug. Um, just quickly, this is a 53-year-old female with breast cancer. She um, was treated with um, AC followed by tamoxifen. Um, she completed her Herceptin and in 2009, so it's an older patient. She presents with progressive fatigue, syncopal episode, and she was anemic, and she was basically diagnosed with um, therapy-induced AML. So she was treated, and this is, as the fellows would know, it happens, of course, on a Friday when you're home, not here. So this is a note I copied right from the chart. And in the yellow, I mean in the red, it basically says redness along the tunnel site from the catheter entrance, two inches plus blood return, attempting to lift the Band-Aid covering the site, complaints of pain. Patient was unsure if redness had been there. So you get this call and the nurse is saying, well, it looks like we're having some issues. There's flushing, there's redness. And the question for the fellows is, what do we do? Um, do we provide this antidote? Do we observe them? And I think this is one of the hard things because when you're not on site, it's hard to look at it. And thank goodness, extravasation um, is not real common. It's less common now. Almost most people have central lines when they get treated. So I'll let you think about what you're going to do. Usually, the in the interest of time, I won't do a survey, but it turned out that they had a dye study on a Saturday morning, believe it or not, and the catheter remained safe for access by the clinical service. So they were able to continue treating this patient and did not have to use um, an antidote. This is just a picture of, of, of Dr. Rubison extravasation of how severe it can be. This is the treatment. You just have to administer within six hours. You do it for three days. Um, you do it in the opposite extremity where you have the extravasation. You take the ice packs off, you know, to restore circulation. Then you infuse the drug. And you can uh, put the ice packs back on. Um, other things that you can do with anthracyclines are facial flushing, histamine relief, 
which can cause this doxorubicin flare, which um, you have to, you know, it's kind of confusing trying to maybe identify that versus extravasation. You can get urine discoloration. It's going to be red with anthocyclines. It's going to be blue with mitoxantrone. And you can also get, um, you can probably get this without chemotherapy, but you can get secondary malignancies um, with these drugs. And just, they're all classified right now for the most part as therapy-induced AML. There was some information that drugs like uh, topoisomerase 2, like a toposide, would have an earlier onset and would have different cytogenetic changes than you would have with the alkylating agents. But since a lot of people get both of these, they're both high risk and they're treated similarly, they're, they're classified as the same thing as therapy-induced AML. Toxorubicin, this is a key. I think these are black box warnings. Extensive liver metabolism, so if they have hepatic failure, you need to adjust the dose or hold the dose. Um, same thing with um, bilirubin or also the transaminases. And I will point out that the, the, the dose adjustments for the anthracyclines are different. So doxorubicin percentage decrease is not the same as it is for donorubicin. So you have to look up each agent independently to do that. This is just a reference that I wanted to put here for you. And it's, if you're interested, it's, it's a pretty good reference on um, renal and hepatic dysfunction for chemotherapeutic agents. Um, they also have this listed in Lexicomp. All right, so this is a 39-year-old HIV male presenting with rapidly growing retroperitoneal mass, extrahepatic biliary obstruction, evidence of tumor lysis with urate neuropathy. So the plan to receive um, hypercevad, which is um, listed here uh, for an unclassified B-cell lineage lymphoma, and uric acid was six. Uh, down from 10 at the previous hospital, or down from 14 actually, and his creatinine is 1.7 elevated, but still, but improved. Um, these are the drugs we have here. Um, so what would we do for this patient? So this is not uncommon for people to come in and it's, the thought is like, well, we're having tumor involvements, um, potentially in the liver, which is causing these increased LFTs. So what we did or what was done for this patient is to hold on to the doxorubicin and vincristine due to the biliary obstruction. Um, consider if he responds rapidly, he got a dose of respiracase. We'd probably give one and a half or three milligrams now, um, as those have been shown to be effective in probably 85% of patients and start allopurinol. If we look at his uric acid, um, it goes down nicely. That respiracase works well. Um, one of the drugs that actually works is advertised for lowering uric acid. Creatinine is improved. So the labs after chemotherapy, we look transaminases are going down, bilirubin is going down. Um, so what we ended up doing is um, giving the, um, basically the doxorubicin because um, the LFT is improved. Just mentioned a little bit about liposomal formulations. They're not interchangeable. They have different diseases, Kaposi sarcoma, ovarian cancer. Um, they are irritants, they're not vesicants. And like I said, they're not interchangeable with conventional um, doxorubicin. You can also, I don't have an exact number, but you can tolerate um, a higher, I, we don't have an equivalent of how this compares to other anthracyclines, other than saying that we know that you can tolerate higher doses um, with decreased cardiac effects for the liposomal products. Um, toxicity profile is different, and you can get these palmar plantar erythral decesias where you may have to have dose adjustments, and stomatitis can be a uh, dose limiting toxicity. Again, there are also produced antibiotic class drugs, so you can get anaphylactoid like reactions. And we'll go on to this. I think this is an interesting is Vixios. So standard treatment for induction for AML patients would be an anthracycline usually given as a bolus or IV push over days, the first three days, followed by, or at the same time, is a continuous infusion cytarabine given over seven days. As you can probably imagine, dosing, administering that way, it's difficult to achieve um, a fixed concentration, which is an optimal concentration for um, killing the leukemic cells. So this product was made with a fixed molar ratio of one to five. So the product is liposomal and it is um, 
where is this? So it's infused oh, at the bottom. So basically it's infused, 99% remains encapsulated when it's in the circulation in the blood. It's taken up by lechemic cells to a greater extent than normal bone marrow cells. And then it degrades when it's in the bone marrow and it releases the chemotherapy intracellularly at this fixed one to five molar ratio, which is the optimal ratio that they found out for um, treating um, leukemia. So this one, quickly moving on, this is a, a really differentiated adenocarcinoma of the ovaries. This person had a TAHBSO, was coming in for cycle one, day one, taxol carbo, or receiving paclitaxel, the patient experienced flushing, redness, um, heart racing, seeing spots, so the infusion was stopped. It was restarted, and they had um, dull pain in the abdomen, nausea, so that infusion was stopped. And then they restarted it again, and they had a rash to arms and thighs. So the carboplatin was not given, had a problem with doxorubicin. Here's where she became flushed. She felt hot. It was restarted. So halfway through, then she did get carboplatin, and she reacted to carboplatin. So she reacted to both agents. Um, they paged the doctor. This is the next time she came in, they were going to give doxorubicin and carboplatin, and the patient actually um, protested a little bit and said, well, you, you can't do that. And the patient had this sheet right here, which was printed from her chart. And this is from, it was an allergist. So this is doxorubicin desensitization. Um, and if you look at it, there's 12 different steps that we have to do this. She wasn't able to get treated that day. She was admitted um, to get this regimen. In fact, she was admitted for all of her cycles of this. I kind of find, find it interesting that the patient had this and was quite aware of the desensitization that we were going to do. And instead of having a single order, basically it had to be pharmacy had to prepare three different bags, three different concentrations. She also had carboplatin desensitization, so she was admitted for both of those. The other anthracyclines we're going to skip through. I do quickly want to mention mitoxantrone. Um, it's AML, it's probably where we see this in salvage regimens. And what's interesting, uh, here's a picture of it, is this is blue. So instead of the red discoloration that you see with the other anthracyclines, you have blue and you can be turning your urine blue. All right, I'm in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all the details here, except to mention that it has this unique side effect, which I hadn't seen for years. And all of a sudden in the last couple of years, we've had three different patients who were treated with um, a salvage regimen and the mitoxantrone can cause this bradycardia into the low 40s. And in each case, the patient, after the five days of mitoxantrone, I think it was five days, then the counts are actually three days, but it was like day five, six, and seven, the um, heart rate returned to normal. We won't go into the interactions. We will go on to a toposide. I always have a difficult time pronouncing this. Um, Epipophytophilotoxins, just like the others, it's from a, a plant, in this case, the mayapple, mandrake plants. Uh, it's been used for treatment for a long time. It's a second generation semi-synthetic and it's non-intercalating. So basically it's a pure topoisomerase 2 inhibitor. Um, it has FDA indications used for testicular cancer. It also has activity in treatment of malignancies such as AML and What's one of the things that's unique about etoposide is it does have oral absorption. So this can be given in a form of um, basically the capsules. So you could either treat, for example, regimens three days IV, or you can do one day IV in clinic and send the patient home on an oral dose. Um, it's highly protein bound. So just to note that low albumin levels result in increased unbound portion. So you may get a little bit more toxicity if you have low albumin and Going back to the IV version, it's infused over 30 minutes. So standard doses that you would get, for example, you know, 100 milligrams per meter squared, you probably aren't gonna see hypotension for the most part. Um, you do see it when you get large doses that you use, for example, for um, bone marrow transplants. And the myelosuppression can be the dose limiting toxicity. Mucositis, stomatitis can be dose limiting with the high doses. And I just have the percentages here. Um, your patients are getting it for example, for lung cancer are much less likely to see these side effects than you are for getting it for um, as part of a conditioning regimen for um, 
a bone marrow transplant. And again, secondary malignancies, headache, fever, bronchospasm, low cardiovascular toxicity, and pretty much neurotoxicity is pretty low with etoposide. Again, um, dose, it does require dose reduction from renal inefficient or insufficiency and hepatic insufficiencies, there's dose reductions. It's a little bit of a, a softer recommendation. So we'll quickly jump to the taxanes, a very interesting drug or class of drugs. Paclitaxel was the original taxane, it's proved in 1992. Um, it's found in the stem bark of Pacific yew trees. There was a lot of controversy and there's several books written out here. Um, I don't know if you've read any of those about basically cutting these forests or these trees down hundreds of years old um, in the Pacific Northwest. Right now they have are able to develop uh, the drug from a semi-synthetic form from renewable sources. So the trees don't have to be um, cut down and destroyed for that. If I look at the taxanes or the rings here, they're fairly complicated. And that was one of the reasons it took a, a while to be able to synthesize these. So the taxanes promote the assembly of microtubules from tubulin dimers and stabilize by preventing depolymerization. So basically they can't come apart once these tubules are formed. They're, they're non-functional. And this results in inhibition of the normal dynamic reorganization and results in slowing or blocking of mitosis at the um, metaphase anaphase transition and introduction of um, apoptotic death. Again, just a schematic for people who like to look at pictures, is we have a normal microtubule here, and these tubulin monomers, is there constantly this change, they're constantly um, evolving or changing, so they are added on one end and taken off on the other end, and what taxanes do is they bind to these, that's the bottom diagram, and basically they become non-functional. And then it interferes with this axonal transport leading to like this link dependent um, chemotherapy that like induced um, neuropathy is one of the side effects you get because of the actions on the nerves here. So resistance, multidrug transporters, we had mentioned those earlier. Also, you can get structural alterization, alter um, alpha and beta tubulins and with an impaired ability to polymerize and you can get um, upregulation of taxane metabolizing enzymes. These are the indications. We're not going to go through all of these. Um, pretty much they're, they're solid tumors. It's not used in um, any heme type malignancies. I have the doses here, and I do want to mention is um, paclitaxel has a much wider dose range than um, docetaxel. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Paclitaxel can go from an hour infusion. When I originally started, they had up to 96 hours, so four days. The most common one when I had started was um, over 24 hours followed by cisplatin for ovarian cancer. And um, we call those Taxol Tuesdays because the drug was new and everybody would come in and they'd be scheduled and they would get their taxanes on Tuesday and um, cisplatin the following morning and then um, be discharged. So one note here, is it has a disproportionate increase in drug exposure and toxicity. So this is thinking like your curve is linear based on the, the metabolism and the dose for a certain range. Then when you get to a certain range, um, it becomes much less predictable. I don't have a picture of those slides, but that means either you don't, you don't really know where you are on the curve, but uh, slight increases can, you know, double your exposure, or depending on where you're on a curve, slight decreases could um, significantly decrease your exposure to this drug. That's contrasts with um, Taxotere or Docetaxel, which is pretty much um, linear. There's no PO availability. Uh, we won't go through all the kinetics here. We will talk a little bit about the hypersensitivity reactions. So we generally divide these into three categories. So we have mild symptoms, um, so you can, infusion under supervision, moderate symptoms, um, which I've listed here, you'd stop the infusion, give uh, diphenhydramine and probably a steroid methylpred, and then you can also resume this at a lower rate. And in severe, one or more, you can have respiratory distress requiring treatment, um, generalized urticaria, angioedema. For the most part, um, you stop it, you give the same medications, you can use epinephrine, and generally you wouldn't re-challenge with paclitaxel. 
I do want to mention that paclitaxel is a very non-soluble drug. So it is, um, it is made, um, it has a vehicle of 50% ethanol and 50% it's polyethoxylated castor oil. So ethanol and castor oil, which is known as cremophore EL. And this is probably one of the, probably the biggest contribution to the hypersensitivity reactions. Although you can have reactions just to the, um, the taxane itself. Docetaxel is a little bit more soluble and it's formulated in a different medium. So it's polysorbate 80. So you have less reactions with docetaxel than you do with paclitaxel. Um, when the drug was first studied, 30% of people untreated would get some sort of infusion reaction. Um, the Cleveland Clinic, I believe, was the first one who developed the, the protocol to pre-med the paclitaxel, and it was based on a radio contrast protocol. Um, when you treat the patients, it's less than 3% of people have reactions. So it decreased this um, by tenfold your reactions. Um, these are somewhat evolving because people want to decrease the steroid exposure. So dexamethasone should be taken prior to chemo, 12 and six hours, patients come in, they forgot their medications or they're inpatient and they didn't order them. Um, so generally you can give 20 milligrams IV prior to the dose. And then steroids are often tapered or reduced for future cycles to decrease um, the, the prednisone or dexamethasone exposure. This is for paclitaxel. Docetaxel is a little different, we'll talk about that. The neutropenia is the dose limiting toxicity. Um, alopecia, pretty much all patients, if you have these doses, 130 to 150 milligram per meter squared. You can have a little bit of hypotension or bradycardia. Um, generally, we don't tell people to hold their beta blockers in the morning. Um, you can get derm, derm effects less than with, uh, again, taxotere. Um, you do have peripheral neuropathy, and they have a, a large range, it says in the literature, so it's 27 to 60%. It's numbness and paresthesis in the glove and stocking distribution. It's the, really due to the, the effects on the tubules that we had discussed, and you can get uh, axial degeneration, demyelinization, um, usually subsides or resolves over weeks to months. So it's similar in effect to the vinca alkaloids, um, but less severe. And this just says three to four percent. It may be severe. Um, it usually occurs. It can occur after a single large dose. Um, I don't think anybody's using 250 milligrams per meter squared anymore. But it can occur after multiple courses of um, 135 to 175 milligrams per meter squared. And it's more pronounced in shorter infusions and weekly schedules. It's increased with other drugs that cause. Um, peripheral neuropathies, so you can cisplatin and the um, finca alkaloids. We'll skip this one. Uh, alopecia, again, it's pretty much universal. And then you do get transient elevations or can with um, um, with the drug. Myalgias and arthralgias, so 24 to 48 hours, you get flu-like symptoms. Um, generally, it's going to be self-limiting at the doses we have here. There's a weak association with cumulative dose, and nothing's been really found to, to prevent this, um, but people do treat it or try to use drugs like non-steroidals or opioids or prednisone. And it's not really dependent on infusion time, you know, one hour versus three hours would be the common one. Black box warnings, so we're moving on to docetaxel. So treatment-related mortality increase with abnormal liver functions. So basically you have to, um, decrease the dose, otherwise you're gonna increase the mortality here. You can also have the severe hypersensitivity reactions. And severe fluid retention occurs with docetaxel and not with um, paclitaxel. And that's really one of the main reasons that you're also to decrease you know, the incidence of fusion reactions, but really to this um, fluid retention is one of the reasons that you give dexamethasone. And you give this, you know, eight milligrams the day prior to day of and day after therapy. Um, this fluid retention, it's poorly tolerated. It's a peripheral edema, generalized edema. You can get pleural effusions, dyspnea at rest, cardiac tamponade. Incidence and severity increase at cumulative doses over 400 milligrams per meter squared. And it resolves slowly at discontinuation. And I don't have the number here, but I think 
well, actually it is. It's listed as a median of 16 weeks. So basically it takes a long time, it take four months for this to totally resolve. All right, neurological toxicities, it's less than paclitaxel. Um, uh, asthenia is common, 60 to 70%. And neutropenia is the dose limiting toxicity. And you get, um, you can get significant nail disorders, hypo hyperpigmentation. Um, you can get localized erythema and edema, and you can get 80 um, alopecia, not quite as high as you can with paclitaxel. And we won't go through all the doses, just to say is if your bilhe is greater than upper limit and normal, you shouldn't administer this. And we won't go through all the drug interactions. Um, cabazitaxel has different indications, hormone refractory metastatic prostate cancer. This is probably used a lot less than the first two taxanes. And I did just want to point out, it still does require these pre-medications. It is formulated, I believe, in polysorbate 80. So infusion reactions are less likely than it is with the other taxanes. Also, this has, I'm not sure it panned out the way they originally thought it was, but it does have a poor affinity for like key glycoprotein, the pump, the MDR pumps. So the thought was that this would have some activity in patients who have um, taxane resistance due to this peak like a protein pump. And it does have some activity in those patient populations. Um, and oh, this, I wanted to bring up this effect. It might be the patient population, prostate cancer um, patients, but uh, hematuria, including those requiring medical intervention were more common in cabazitaxel. Um, the incidence of grade two was 6% um, versus these more prostate cancer patients versus mitoxantrone, um, which seems a, a little bit on the high side. All right. Uh, adverse effects, primary prophylaxis with GCSF growth factors should be considered in patients with high risk clinical features. So, and this is probably in general, anybody who's going to have a 20% incidence of neutropenia could probably use. Um, growth factor prophylaxis, and then you can also consider these other factors, um, older age, um, performance status, previous episodes of neutropenia, um, radiation, nutrition status, all things that are going to predispose them to increased complications from prolonged neutropenia. And quickly, we'll mention paclitaxel protein-bound particles. So these are nanoparticles. It's bound to albumin. They're approved for treatment of breast cancer after failure of combination chemotherapy. Um, it does have a little different uh, side effect profile. It doesn't require um, pre medications to prevent hypersensitivity reactions. You don't have to use the special tubing for this one. And in summary, uh, the particles formulation has notable advantage over conventional. So it's got lower toxicity, meaning severe neutropenia, shorter infusion time. I guess they're very similar now that we're doing one hours. And, but maybe, maybe um, increased. Um, efficacy. And I think part of this is doing this that it's like encapsulated in albumin and um, these tumor cells actually have receptors that can pick up the albumin. So you may get higher concentrations. So this is probably the last class of drugs we'll get to. Um, so the vinca alkaloids are naturally occurring semi synthetic compounds found in minute quantities in the periwinkle plant. I have these listed here. So if you look they're fairly old drugs. Um, 1963 was first approved. Vincristine is more common in pediatric oncology. And in general, these are better tolerated in a pediatric population, which I guess is the case for a lot of cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, Vinblastine is used in integral component for germ cell malignancies, um, lymphomas, and other agents um, for diseases that I have listed here. This is just a picture, um, periwinkle. Uh, it used to be called Vinca Periwinkle, but they had changed the name, and it's from Madagascar. Structurally, they're very similar if we look at these, um, but they do have different toxicity profiles or dose linear toxicities. So they're cell cycle specific. They rapidly and reversibly bind to sites on beta tubulin different than the taxanes. Um, they even named it um, the Vinca domain, so it's easy to remember. 
It induces a conformational change to the tubulin, increasing its affinity for itself, leading to these paracrystalline aggregates. I have a schematic or picture on the next page. It decreases the pool of free tubulin dimers available. So it, it is um, this microtubule poison, it works that way, but it works different than the taxanes do. So it results in a shift of the equilibrium toward disassembly and microtubule shrinkage. And again, this causes cell division um, or cell division arrest in metaphase. And if we look at the picture here, in the middle you have, or you have the microtubule on the left, then you have these fruit, these tubulin dimers. So what happens is the, the vincristine or the other vincas, they bind to these dimers and then they stick together and basically take them out of circulation. So you don't have these tubulin dimers that you have necessary to polymerize the microtubules. So then it shifts the, the equilibrium toward uh, depolymerization. So as far as resistance, again, the MDR pump, which we showed very early on, you can also have structural and functional alterations of the alpha beta tubulins or alpha and beta tubulins um, from genetic mutations, or really you can have post um, exposure modifications. And they do share some resistance within each other. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that it's fatal if given intrathecally. I would say this is probably in the past has been the drug would cause the most fatalities due to, due to errors. And um, you, it's this characterized severe microencephalopathy or myeloencephalopathy, ascending motor and sensory neuropathies and rapid death, um, the recommendation is, and we do this, and I think everybody else does, is to put this in a bag so that you're not going to accidentally give it intrathecally. That being said, that wasn't always the case. And I actually remember we, there was a patient who did get um, intrathecal vincristine here at UW Health. Um, the dose was, I can't remember if it's one or two milligrams per mil, but they got like a tenth of a mil. So the patient actually, before it was noticed that it was the wrong drug, and they did end up going down to TLC, and you know they have different treatment strategies that they can use. So even with a tenth of the dose administered, the patient still um, basically had paralysis and uh, did not end up walking uh, out of the hospital. So they are vesicants. Uh, Vinarelbine is a little less. You can use hyaluronidase, um, the extravasation guidelines. Um, be, it's probably good to look at those you know, before you start writing orders, um, but they are really good on Uconnect. They have two separate ones. They have one for chemotherapy and they have one for non-chemotherapy. The real key for the Vinca alkaloids is this is probably the only drug or class of drugs that you apply in warm compresses um, instead of ice when you have extravasation. And this is really to uh, increase the disbursement of the drug and the breakdown of it. So you have less concentrations. Despite similar structures, toxicity profiles are kind of different. The neurotoxicity, they're similar, but they're less with vinaralbine and uh, vinblastine, meaning they're most common with vincristine. So neurotoxicity is the most common toxicity for vincristine. It appears after five to eight milligrams and can be found after 15 to 20 milligrams. And this one, I know it's not cutting edge literature. It's blood, 1963, but I think it's interesting because this is one of the publications from Paul Carbone is the leading author. Obviously our cancer center is named after him. So just to give you a quick overview on this, is 40 patients who had malignancies that wasn't controlled by surgery or radiation they were treated to the point of toxicity. Um, so they get these paresthesias without pain occurred in most patients. Depression of deep tendon reflexes occurred in all the patients. Um, it was reversible with it, or the paresthesis was reversible within several weeks with most, but persisted up to six months after therapy was um, stopped. And their analysis of this was the relationship of toxicity to the individual weekly dose is presented in this graph. And they concluded that the tolerated dose is 0.05 milligrams per kilogram, which is the right arrow for the majority of patients. So 
I find that kind of interesting because if you calculate that out, 0.05 milligrams per kilogram for an 80 kilogram person is going to be um, four milligrams. So that's something that we would never give now. I mean, we think we're pushing a dose when we give two milligrams, which is uh, listed here. Um, so probably the reason they did that in 1963, this is when it was published, so they were obviously treated before that, is the patients did get a response. They had tumor regression in, for example, 10 of 10 patients with Hodgkin's. Um, there was really not a, not, not a lot of other drug options to use at that time. So something that works, they were gonna push it um, to the maximum. Oftentimes doses are reduced and people have this, the neuropathies that they will either drop the dose from two milligrams or give a, a flat one milligram dose. So this is, I would say this is probably one of the most common meds that uh, we do um, that is reduced. So just a little quick, the toxicity is peripheral symmetric. Um, it's mixed sensory numbness and tingling, loss of deep tendon reflexes is early, motor weakness, sensory changes, do not usually warrant an immediate reduction in a drug. Whereas the flip side is loss of motor function results, usually results in a discontinuation of the drug. There's no treatment to reduce or prevent this. Um, it can progress, it can progress even weeks after the discontinuation of the drug. I have some risk factors. So we kind of saw the cumulative dose, pre-existing neurological conditions, alcoholic or diabetic associated neuropathies, um, elderly people, um, so children tolerate this better. Um, poor nutritional performance status in combination with other drugs that either have interactions or additive toxicity. Um, the one thing, this is a busy slide, is to, actually we won't go through this one, but I will mention that um, people should be on a bowel regimen because this is going to cause constipation for patients. So all of the regimens that have vinca alkaloids built in them, the treatment plans have um, should have bowel regimens built in them. Oh, this is what I was talking about here. All right, so since we're running out of time, um, I will say renal, renal insufficiency, there's no dose adjustment, and um, Billy Rubin is going to need a dose adjustment. So I'm just gonna go to the very last question. We'll skip these, just for your reference. And, the use of body surface area as criterion of drug dosages in cancer. Most of the pharmacy residents that I ask this um, kind of have a bewildered look on their face. So I don't know why we did that and they try to think about it. Um, again, this is just, we'll end it with an old study. So basically it goes back to pediatrics where they were more used to dosing based on even fluids and things based on um, things other than just your kilograms. So like body surface area. So they had taken these two drugs here, methotrexate and mefloroethamine. And what they had found, they dosed them for humans and then they used rats, hamsters and mice. And actually in the bottom, they had older children or adults. But what they found out is that the toxicities that they're using in these animals correlated best in a milligram per meter squared dose. So they take toxicities in animals and they did this like anthropomorphic scaling from mouse to hamster to rat. And then they had started using meter squared dosing um, for their chemotherapeutic agents. So I find it kind of interesting that it's based on a, originally on toxicities in animals. I suspect if we had to do this again, that we may use a different type of dosing, um, maybe lean body mass or something like that. All right, so I know we're running out of time. Um, I think I'm already five minutes over. I think this is supposed to be 50 minutes. Does anybody have, I know I talked quick and, does anyone have any questions or comments or cases that you want to share? All right. If yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, thanks, Mike. And I'll, I'll make sure to share the slides after the talk today for everyone. I had a quick question. Sure. Um, when you were talking about the inpatient desensitization protocol for uh -huh. anthracyclines, um, 
who do we do that on? Is it anyone that has a hypersensitivity reaction? Or so we haven't done it a lot. I think it's it depends if it was a severe hypersensitivity. It, I guess it depends what the reaction is. That you know you could do different premeds if they're getting a a bolus. The premeds are going to last. Um, I think it's somebody who doesn't really have an alternative, or, or this is like by far the best treatment strategy that you want to use is the anthracyclines, and they had somewhat of a moderate reaction to do that. And then, because you know they're going to get seven more cycles or whatever they need. Um, I don't think you'd have to do that if it's just a, a, a minor reaction, and then probably if it's like a severe hypersensitivity reaction, you really would want consideration of maybe not doing it. So there's, there's not a really good answer. Um, Sorry. That's okay. Thanks. I yeah. just had never heard of it before, but I haven't um, dealt with it a lot. Yeah. The this particular patient, uh, they wanted to do it because they had reactions to, you know, the taxanes, the carboplatin, and the doxorubicin. So three of the main drugs you're using for ovarian cancer. So this, they were kind of running out of your, you know, first second um, choices. From the few patients I've seen, generally they're heavily exposed to chemo um, as well. So I don't know if that adds a risk or not. Carboplatin, it, it definitely does, right? The more doses of carboplatin you get, the you don't react on doses one and two. I'm not sure about anthracyclines, um, but that very well could be. But yeah, we haven't seen it on a lot. Carboplatin is more common to desensitize than um, like doxorubicin, and we have a protocol for that also. Any other questions, comments?